Hello folks, old Buster coming to you again. Name of this store is Cajuns. Now Walter and Jesse was playing some mumbler peg out back of the barn whilst waiting to see what all the jawing was about with Jesse's pa and Walter's pa. Now Buster and I drove up after a bit because they had some chores to finish up before they could get there. Mr. Holmes and Grandpa Gus come out about that time too and all them then folks uh, told the boys to gather on around. Now this was before sundown and the boys' paws weren't known not to burn daylight. So something had to be up for them to all of them be at the same spot at the same time. When Jesse's paw was over the pipelines for Southern Natural Gas, there was a new installation going on down in Louisiana. Louisiana, some people say. That way, but it was having real problems. Not only was Sonat losing money right and left, but the gas pipeline was for a top secret government installation that nobody really knew nothing about. Now that part of the country was right fond of flooding now and again, and there was right smart of a swamp to get through too for installing the pipeline now. Not to mention the gators, snakes, skeeters, and them skeeters them local folk called gallon nippers. They'd take a feller away. When them female skeeters took a notion for a bite, they took a gallon. If you swatted one, you better be prepared for a transfusion, they said. Now them dang buffalo gnats would kill stock. They was so thick the stock would breathe them in so you could figure what they would do to a body, that's for sure. Well, Mr. McBrayer, Mac they called him, you know, took out some papers and began to read them to the boys, as all the men folk already knowed what was in them. The papers was from Mr. Hiram Holmes and the president of Southern National Gas. Sonat they call him, Southern Natural Gas. And Sonat had some real good hands of working and a good ramrod, but nobody was sabotaging, but somebody was sabotaging the work and putting them behind the schedule. Not only was they behind schedule, but it was keeping the new top secret government installation from doing what they were supposed to be doing. And that was even worse than losing money. Now Mr. Hiram Holmes asked the men folk if they thought the boys could get away to help him out down there considering the importance of what all was going on. Now each one of them boys knowed about the pipelining, you know. Hired with the dirt work and excavating and Walter in the welding and Jesse with right away clearing and Buster setting pipe. Every one of the boys could operate heavy equipment too and was good at it. Now, Mr. Hiram wanted the boys to be on the lookout for who was doing the shenanigans and stopping the work, plus help get the feel if anything could speed up the installation. Now, Buster knowed the Fontenot boys and lots of other their pipeline friends, you know. And Jesse knowed a fair amount of pipeliners from working on the pipeline with his and Paul. And Walter knowed lots of pipeline welders, and Hired knowed a bunch of the old boys that done dirt work on the pipeline, so the boys would be accepted real easy like to work on the pipeline. A lot of pipelining, isn't it? Now one thing Mr. Hiram wanted to know, if and Jesse could whip up a batch of cream that would help out with them skeeters and buffalo gnats and other critters. They was a raising a ruckus with the pipeline workers and slowing down the work by making them sick and all, plus the worsenness of some biting all the time. Jesse said he had an idea about that and would mix up a batch before they left out. Of course, all the boys said they would go and would be ready tomorrow morning. I was going to ride his new Harley Davidson motorcycle that Elvis gave him. And Buster and Jesse was going to fly the Queen and Walter was driving Buster Ford with his and two grays, Stoney and Smokey. Now Buster and Jesse was going to fly over the job site and look over the route where the pipe was going to be laid to get a good bird's eye view of what was going on. Now the boys figured they'd be covered as far as transportation was concerned depending on what was needed at any given time. Well, that night Buster called Ernie and Greg Fontenot and asked if they was in and could go to work. Well, Both of the Fontenot boys would meet Buster at the job site when they got there. Ernie and Greg also said they could get some real good boys if Buster needed them and needed some good hands. Buster said he figured they would and would pay top dollar for them and their rigs. Well, Buster and Jesse got in before Walter and hired, of course, and went on out to the site with Ernie and Greg Fontenot. Well, Buster called and had the Fontenot boys pick them up 
on the grass strip not far from the kickoff point of the pipeline. Then Buster and Jesse and the Fontenot boys went out and met up with everybody and got acquainted like. Lots of the boys are working knowed Buster and Jesse and about all of them knowed the Fontenot's. The ramrod was a feller named Renard Boudreaux, six foot eight and 365 pounds. His hair was shoulder length and had arms like tree trunks and hands like hams. But the nicest feller you'd ever want to meet, excepting when you crossed him up. <clears throat> Big feller. In fact, I think he was 6'9 instead of 6'8. Well, Renard welcomed the boys and was the only one that knowed why the boys was there, but he didn't let on none. He visited with Buster and Jesse and told them he just couldn't get a hold of what all was going on, except that somebody was trying to keep this here job from being getting done with. He said he surely appreciated the help and that there was another feller or two uh, they were supposed to be there with them. Well, Jesse told Renard that Walter and Hyde was on their way. Renard said he was glad another big one was around, meaning Buster, because he just might need a hand to hold him sometime. Now Buster done about got his and growing done. He was about six foot four, around 240 pounds himself. But when it come to stout, old Renard just might have his and hands full. Jesse was a waiting for that day, I tell you. It would be a sight for sure, them two are tussling. Well, the next day, Walter and Hyde come on in. Ernie and Greg showed the boys where to stay and with the crew and all, and they got settled in there at the campsite. Well, the next morning, work began. First thing, Jesse got in a P-Row and pulled down in the swamp to see where was the best place to cross. Well, Jesse caught up with Renard and said he reckoned quicksand would be a problem if they didn't reroute a bit south. Renard and Jesse went on out for a look-see, and sure enough, Jesse was right. Renard thanked him for taking a gander and wondered why the engineer didn't notice that. Well, Buster was a setting pipe, and Hyde was a digging and covering, whilst Walter and the welders was a matching pipe. Ernie and Greg was real experienced at welding pipe, and even Walter could see something was wrong with most of the fellers working with them. Walter catches up with Renard and tells him what all he done seed. At dinner time, all the boys reported to Renard and told him something was surely afoot. Renard uh, and all the, had all the men together up and he fired all but six men. Renard knowed Ernie and Greg and asked them to go back up to the shack and get Deanna and to make some calls for them to get the boys they know to come to the work. Well, Ernie and Greg made the calls and then some more later on that night and said there would be a dozen good hands in there inside of two days time. Later on that week when the men come in, work started to pick up and was going smooth like, and they was making up time. Well, Jesse done brung out that cream for the skeeters and other bugs, and that helped out right smart now. First off, about all them Cajuns. They don't start a job unless they get them about a 60-pound hog. Them Cajuns put a hard hat on that hog and strapped it down so it wasn't going to fall off, and don't feed him nothing but onions and wine. At the end of the job, they barbecued that hog along with other fixes. There's boudin, gumbo, crawdads, frog legs, fish, gator tail, and shrimp. Corn on the cob, which Jesse hates, taters, cornbread, and slaw. Dutch oven peach bread pudding for dessert. Puts on the finishing touch. Well, for the time being, that hog runs around the job site with that hard hat strapped on his nade. <laughs> that hog has a run of the place now. If a crane or other piece of equipment is coming down the road and that hog is a basking in the sunshine, the equipment goes around him. That hog just ain't disturbed none so not to cause him no grief. He's the king and the cap. That meat is sure enough going to be tender, I'm telling you. Well, all during the job, that hog is carried for a real special like. He don't get nothing but onions and wine, and y'all can see that old hog a stumbling around younger than a cooter brown most of the day. Well, after the Cajun boys brung in the hog, the job got into full swing. After about a couple of weeks, Mr. Hiram called to see how things were progressing. The boys and Renard got on speakerphone and gave him a report. Then Mr. Hiram asked to speak to the boys alone, and Renard excused himself. 
Well, Mr. Hiram said Uncle Jeff was in town and to look out for him, but not to let on they know who he was. He said things was running too smooth and to expect anything. If an A.D. did anything, just to call him. Well, that Saturday night, all the boys and crew went to town. They first off went to eat <laughs> at a seafood place they heard was real good. Well, Buster and the boys all sat at the same table with the Fontenot's and a couple of fellers they knowed, and the crew all pulled up tables and chairs next to them. You never did see the like of eating and drinking beer now. Wasn't long after they got their food that one of the boys that knowed Greg Fontenot asking him if he didn't have a song for them. Well, old Greg just up and begins to singing, prettiest country singing you ever heard, about like on the old Grand Ole Opry. All the other folks in the restaurant went to listen to Greg sing, but it weren't long before the manager come around and told Greg he had to quit singing. Well, Ernie Greg's brother up and leaves the restaurant when Greg began to sing it again. Well, here come the manager. Well, Buster, Walter, Hire, and Jesse didn't rightly know what to think about anything, but Greg's singing was real good, they said. Now, other customers told the manager to let Greg be, and he kept the singing until he was done. <laughs> The boy could sing, though. Reckon all them boys that knowed Greg knowed that he was going to do so until they lit his up. He just kept to singing. Said it was right embarrassing and didn't want to get thrown out and have to leave their vittles, is what Ernie said. There was a dance uh, a gal told Greg about and all the crew went on over for some fun. The local boys didn't quite take kindly to the pipeline crew getting next to their gal, so all. They didn't go for that now. The old Greg got in there and sure enough went right up front with the band and told him he was going to sing him a song. Well, after he got the band to playing along and him a singing, one of them local boys just had to break bad and start a ruckus. Well, sir, the fight was on. It was a right good tussle, but nobody was hurt none too bad, just a black eye or two and a split lip. After all was said and done, it was just another typical Saturday night. Sundays was for church going and family, except if a feller wanted to work, he could. There was always a few of the crew that wanted the extra hours and the pay was good and they needed to make hay whilst the sun was a shining, so to speak, since they was getting overtime, double time in fact. Reynard was out early and checked on the job every day. One of the crew was a young helper and was told to cross the bio and check the depth. The boy went in over his and hate and his and hip boots that was weighing him down. They filled up with water and he come up out of them boots. But there was a cotton mouth that, that was nearby and bit the boy on the arm. A couple of the boys in the crew run up and drug him out of the water. Hyde was on his and motorcycle and rode up to where the boy was. Well, Hyde took a piece of baling wire and looped it around his and spark plug and stuck it to the other end to the, to the snake bite. Then he told one of the men to crank the motor. Well, the spark from the plug went through the wire into the snake bite and hired done that about five, five times around the bite. It neutralized the poison and just left the boy with a sore arm is all. Now all the men working knocked off work for the day and went home after that. The boy was a little sore the next day, but other than that, just fine. Now that story got around the crew mighty quick. They all wanted to know that trick for sure. Well, the next morning, the job site was a mess. Somebody had scattered pipe, tools, and equipment everywhere. After cleaning that up, two days later, somebody put sugar in the fuel tanks of the trucks the men drove. The following week, even the, with security, somebody drained a hydraulic fluid out of one of the main cranes for lifting pipe. Now, Renard was in the trench with the welders when the crane lost the pipe and it fell trapping Renard under it. Now Buster was there helping set pipe for the next joint when it all happened. He jumped down in the trench and hollered to the fellers up top to get some bracing. The men up top lowered some ties and four befores to the welders and Buster told them to brace that pipe when he lifted it. Renard wasn't no help as he was knocked out cold and was barely breathing with the load on him. Now Buster grabbed a tie and throwed it down on the muddy ground for a solid foundation for good footing and then he got up under that pipe and told the boys to brace her when he lifted it up. The welder said, Buster, there ain't no way. We gotta wait for another crane. Buster said, you boys 
do what I tell you. There weren't no time. See, it started uh, raining about that time, and the trench, trench was a flooding. Well, Buster got set and got up under that pipe and began to lift it. He got her up to where the bracing could be put up in and that pipe, and then set her down as the welders pulled the Reinhardt out the way. The men up top put Big Reinhardt into a truck and took him to town to the hospital to be tended to. Well, Buster, Jesse, Walter, and Hired had the men gather around for a set tea. Buster said this was getting plumb out of hand and somebody was going to get killed and he wasn't going to have none of it. Well, Jesse told the men that some of them knowed him and that his and Paul was over the pipeline installation and that he was going to take over for Reinhardt until they got somebody to fill in. Walter and Hired said they was going to finish this here pipeline come hell in the high water and wanted to know if the Navy was with him. Ernie and Greg Fontenot was the first to step up and then the rest of the crew followed. Buster said that was it for the day and they would hit it bright and early the next morning be ready to work. Well, Buster said to the boys to break open the beer and let's have a powwow. Let's get on down to brass tacks boys. Somebody is trying to shut this job down and seems like to kill us to boot. Now, being a mite fractious right now, Buster told the men, they sure enough needed to make sure that didn't happen and let's do something about it. Any ideas? Well, there was a lot of them, but them Cajun boys know the thing or two and asked if they could do what was needed to be done. They wanted to do it too. The sheriff sure wasn't handling the situation none too good. Buster and Jesse told them to do what they wanted to, but they just had to stop all this carrying on before somebody got killed. That night, the boys went to the hospital to see Reynard. When they walked in the room, Reynard just smiled. He told Buster he knowed he needed another big one around, and that he heard from the crew what he'd done. Well, Reynard stuck out that big paw of his and then shook Buster's hand and thanked him for saving his and life. Then Uncle Jeff walked in. Woo-wee, Walter's Uncle Jeff. Walter told Uncle Jeff that he was a sight for sore eyes for sure, and what in the world was it going on? Well, after telling Reynard that the job was being taken care of and to take it easy for a few days, the boys and Uncle Jeff left on out. They all went to the boys' room and had their self a confab about all this sabotage. Now, Uncle Jeff told them what all was going on, Mr. Hiram and Dalton and Devane. This weren't just no competition trying to get the best of another company. It was international. Sure enough, it was them Muslims again, and they was getting help from the Chinese. Contacts in France was making this all happen. Them Muslims couldn't hardly get nothing right except in killing themselves while hurting other folks. But the Chinese were smart little fellers. They was using French citizens that was Muslim and Chinese to get the lowdown on how things worked in Louisiana. The whole shebang was about the government installation that was being built. Well, most folks didn't know Louisiana had a 30,000 acre surface coal mine to go along with ports and a nuclear power plant and other resources the enemies of the U.S. could use. This underground facility that was being built was the brainchild of Mr. Hiram and top military personnel and scientists. There was some stuff in there that would put Area 51 and 52 both to shame. Now these terrorists was on a short string with what was going to be put on them. That pipeline not only supplied natural gas to the whole darn place, but it had a pipe in a pipe that was right special. It was a conduit to underground tunnels five miles deep in the earth. The U.S. Air Force had a tunneling machine that you just wouldn't believe. Heck, fire, they had tunnels running every which place across the country. Now, the boys know Mr. Holmes was right tricky about some things, but this was off of the charts. They reckoned they was in for some big surprises on this little adventure. Well, Uncle Jeff said to keep on their toes, and he would uh, be a-watching and a-keeping tabs on things. The swamps was something to deal with, but them Cajun boys said it weren't nothing for a stepper if you knowed how to deal with them. Well, guards was put out night and day, and things got to percolating along pretty good. When Walter wasn't a welding, he was a riding the perimeter on one of his engraves. But old Stoney was the one to get on into the thick of things. He wasn't scared not one whit of gunfire. 
Renard got back to work a bit sore, but Perton there fit as a fiddle. Well, Jesse done whacked a few ground rattlers and copperheads leading the right of way crew, and Walter was welding up a storm when not riding the herd on the crew on the job site. Buster was a helping set pipe, and Hired was a working like a beaver digging and covering pipe. One even Walter come to Buster and told him he had to well pipe over into a slough and needed some help. There was no Ernie fighting over with Walter in that flat bottom boat, and Greg was singing up a storm at the head of the pipe going into the water. Now Buster had Jesse to take the bow, well bow I guess, and he took the stern of the boat and helped it steady whilst Walter and Ernie welded them up. Well, a mile of a drizzle commenced, and Ernie said they'd finish up this here last joint and call it a day. The aluminum got a little slickery, and Buster slipped when Ernie was a moving around the pipe of welding. Now, Buster tried to catch his himself, but just couldn't get his in balance on that slickery aluminum of the boat. All the weight went to one side, and the boat capsized. Well, all four of them went into the water. Now, it weren't that deep, but just deep enough for a couple of gators to hide out. One of them gators took on after Jesse there. Buster and Walter tackled that gator hanging on for dear life. The other gator went for Buster and about the time he was going to chomp down on Buster's leg, Renard straddled that gator. Boy, how'd he talk about a tussle? It was the mud, the blood, and the beer, hide, hair, and all. Dang if and Renard didn't pull that bowie knife of his and stuck that gator good and then took a jaw on each of them huge hands of his and ripped that gator's jaws apart of leaving him a floating in the sloop. Well, in the meantime, Jesse and Ernie got out the water and Walter held the other gator's jaws close, tight while Buster hauled the gator to the bank. A couple of the Cajun boys come over and dispatched that gator right timely like. Them boys went to a hollering about gator tail for supper tonight. <laughs> then. Well, Buster went up to Renard and hugged him right up, telling him how much he appreciated him keeping that other gator off of him. Well, old Renard said he had to take care of his little brother, turn about fair play. Well, both of them walked off just to Grinning, and Jesse was sure glad them two was as stout as they was. The body just didn't know how stout a gator was till he done grabbed a hold of one of them. <laughs> Things wasn't progressing right along, and the pipeline was just about to the government facility when all hell done broke loose one evening with fur a flying. Boy, oh boy, there was a bunch of Mexicans that hit them late as the crew was a hating back in. The crew was rousted and had to run off as they didn't have the firepower that the Mexicans had. Nobody was hurt, but when the sheriff come back, the place was tore up something bad and the pipeline blowed up along with several pieces of equipment. Well, Uncle Jeff bent up with the boys in Renard and uh, he kept his and crew on standby until the thing got sorted out a bit. Now come to find out, the fellers that jumped the boys and the crew was, was Mexican and South American. The Muslims and the Chinese was using them to get the job done and to stir the pot. That way it looked like Chavez or Mexican drug lords was doing the dirty work. Well, the next morning Uncle Jeff outfitted the boys with a little firepower of their own. Wasn't going to be no more surprises like yesterday. Buster said he wanted to go up into the Queen and take a look-see for a, a camp where the raiders come from. Well, Uncle Jeff thought that was a good idea. Well, Buster and Jesse took off that next morning early looking for the camp of the bad guys and was planning on being back about noon. Well, both Buster and Jesse had their locators on them and a radio to report into and that Uncle Jeff uh, had... Uh, fixed up so he could be patched into Mr. Hire. It took about an hour and a half before Buster and Jesse found the camp. It was on a knoll out in the swamp and there was airboats galore around it. Well, Jesse spotted, spotted the camp first and told Buster to circle around and he'd get a head count as best he could and see what type of equipment they had. Well, Buster banked to the right and come in to where Jesse could get a gander at the camp. Well, after Buster flew over to camp and turned back to the airstrip, Jesse began to holler. Buster, he hollered, it's a missile. Sure enough, it was an impact surface-to-air missile. Buster pulled up hard and banked the Queen hard to the left when the missile hit him. The missile took out the tail section of the Queen and the plane went down in the swamp, a fur piece from the camp. 
<coughs> excuse me, folks. When the queen landed in the water, Buster grabbed a hold of Jesse and pulled him out of the cockpit. Both of them were spun up in a bleeding mite, but alive. It was a miracle they weren't killed, but a small cypress treetop caught the queen and then just sort of laid them down in the water. Jesse was out cold from a bump on his head, and Buster's legs were aching something fierce from being banged up in the fuselage. But they was alive, but the airboats was a coming. Buster had to get them away from the queen because they would be a searching for her. Lucky for Buster and Jesse, he had a survival kit he kept in the queen because they was going to need it. Gators was a coming towards them and Buster just had to get up on higher ground with Jesse where they were safe. First thing he seed was a big old log floating nearby and he got Jesse up on it and began to paddle into a clump about 150 yards away. Gators was all over the plane by now and they done got to Buster's lunch. You know, that boy always had something good to eat with him. When the airboats come, they all see gators rolling in the water fighting for Buster's lunch, thinking it was them. Of course, the bad guys didn't know it was Buster's lunch. Thought it was just Buster and Jesse. The Mexicans left on out knowing ain't nobody going to survive that crashing in the swamp like that. Well, Buster had his locator on, and when him and Jesse didn't come back at dark, a search was begun. Well, Uncle Jeff and Hired and Walter knowed something was the matter when Buster and Jesse didn't call in when they was late. Uncle Jeff called Mr. Hiram and told him what all happened. And Mr. Hiram called the boys' folks and told them all about what had happened, and the men folk got a plane arranged for him by Mr. Hiram in Louisiana. Now, the fat was in the fire then, folks. You better believe that. The search had been on for three days and still no luck. Everybody was pretty down when the signal was lost on Buster's locator. The general vicinity was known, but the raiders had moved from the knoll to another location. Now Jesse lost his locator in the crash and was a mite loopy for a day or so till he got his in bearings. Concussion, Buster reckoned. Well, Cajun's got a network of communication. Pierre Thibodeau was a visiting some kin when the grapevine told him about Buster and Jesse. Now, Monique done figured it out. It was Jessie that had the money sent to her and her folks, and she had done, had Jessie's pheromones and her, but good. She told Pierre to go find Jessie and Buster and be quick about it. She said to gather all their kin and make a beeline for where they was last spotted. Now, Renard Boudreau know to Pierre and his clan, and the grapevine told him they was a coming looking for Jessie and Buster, and Lord help the ones that done for them. Cajun justice was swift, and the boys were not only friends, but family as far as they was concerned. Now, Renard went to Walter and hired, and they took him to see Uncle Jeff, and Renard told him what was to happen at this very minute. Now, Uncle Jeff said he sure did hope PR and his boys found Buster and Jesse soon. Everybody was worried to the bone, you know. Well, Mr. Hiram had a satellite of looking and found the queen. Wasn't there a soul to be found there when the search and the rescue fellers dropped in by helicopter. Buster done what Walter always said. Just go west. Sooner or later, you was going to hit home. Well, Buster swam, paddled, and drug Jesse for most of two days till Jesse could help out some. The survival kit let Buster purify water and had energy bars and them special blankets to keep warm. Now, Buster doctored on Jesse as best he could and took duck cake and wrapped his and hurt legs. Buster got a fish and a couple of frogs and fixed them something to eat on the second day. The third day, Buster and Jesse hit marsh that was hard going. Took them all day to cross till they hit open water again. One thing Buster done was to put some of that cream Jesse made up for the Skeeters in a survival kit. That surely was a blessing, I tell you. The sixth day, Pierre found Buster toting Jesse. Wore to a frazzle, but grinning when he seed Pierre. Buster said, what took you so long? Well, Pierre got Jesse and his and Pierrot and Buster and Jean Michel's, Jean Michel's, whatever they say it in French. That was Pierre's cousin. <coughs> there was two other Pierrot's along with Pierre and Jean Michel, and them boys was cousins. They headed north for a spell and back west a while and camped for the night. Buster was glad for a hot cup of coffee and some crackers and spam. Jesse was feeling better with some hot coffee and something to eat too. 
Pierre said they'd be back to where they could get back up to Baton Rouge tomorrow and they could call their people and folk. Well, sure enough, about two in the afternoon they hit land, solid ground that is, and made their calls. Helicopters flew in and got the boys and arrangements was made to get Pierre and his and Ken and their p rolls back to Purlington. Before Pierre left out, he told Jesse and Buster that Monique and all of his and Ken knowed they sent the money. Mr. Factor's story didn't hold water even though he tried to tell it straight. Pierre said they was grateful and Jesse had better be sure to call Monique in soon. Well, Jesse said he would and not to tell her, but would probably stop over in New Orleans and see her. Pierre said if and he did, he had to come by and see his and folks too. Boy, howdy, was everybody glad to see the boys. All the boys' paws was there, and Buster and Jesse had to tell the story half a dozen times over. The boys' paws said they was a stay until the pipeline was in, and that was all there was to it. Now, Mr. Holmes called and was on the speakerphone telling what all was going on overseas with Dalton and Devane. It sure wasn't pretty for the other side, I'm here to tell you. Now this here Mexican and South American bunch had to be dealt with in pronto. Renard asked Mr. Hiram if he couldn't have one of them helicopters fly him around for the day. Well, Mr. Hiram said for sure, but what was he up to? Renard said these here raiders ain't seen no fight until Cajun got to fighting. There was going to be hell to pay for what they done. There was an army in them swamps, and ain't nobody know them swamps better than the Cajun. Well, Uncle Jeff had local police and some presidential corps fellers to get in on the fracas, too. So when the word come to where the raiders was holed up, they made their plans for attacking them. Well, Uncle Jeff said he would like a word or two with their leader, but didn't rightly care if any of them come out to the swamp alive. Renard said gators got to eat, too. Well, when word come where the Mexicans and South Americans was at, it didn't take long to take them out. Pierre and his men took care of business and got some information that Uncle Jeff needed from their leader. <clears throat> Uncle Jeff and his men fought real good, but Pierre and the boys didn't bring back no predators when they caught up with them in the swamp. Airboats run on guys, but it don't last long in the swamp. There wasn't no prisoners, period. Well, Uncle Jeff relayed the information that Pierre got from the leader of the raiders to Mr. Hiram, and it was good intel. Well, intelligence, you know, spine stuff, he said. Well, the crew, Renard and Ramrodden, Grandpa Gus assisting with him riding Smokey, Mr. Holmes, Mr. Ollinger, and Mr. McBrayer got the pipeline in in no time at all. The government facility was strictly off limits to everybody, even the boys, but Mr. Hiram Holmes made them promise to fill them in soon, sometime soon. Boys is looking forward to that promise, too. Renard found that there was a local feller that was a spying on the job and giving information for money from a feller out of Baton Rouge. He was tied into the drug ring out of New Orleans. From there on, it went up the ladder till all the pieces of the puzzle was put together, according to Mr. Hiram. <clears throat> well, after the pipeline was in, there was the biggest dadgum party ever to be put on in that part of the country. Now, every Cajun in the swamps was there. Zyda Cole and Cajun music was a playing there, and there was food aplenty. Anything a body wanted to drink was there too. So that Mr. Himes sprang for the whole shebang. Well, somebody hollered for Jesse to play the fiddle, and finally he got up and played a familiar old song with Jimmy C. Newman, Born to Love You. As he was playing, she walked up to him and started to sing to him. Now, if Jesse wasn't surprised, he about near swallowed his tongue. Well, after the song and the snort of old McBrayer, Jesse got his and wits about him. Monique had quite a few words to say to Jesse. I know it was you who sent the money. I know you have decisions to make for your life and things you got to do, but I want to, you to know me a me you or whatever that is in French, Jesse Darrell McBrayer. I want you to know I will be here if and then you want me. Basically, I think it means you're mine. I don't really know, folks. I'm not a French talker. Well, Jesse was in quite the pickle over all this and didn't bargain for this soon. <laughs> that boy. Monique didn't put no pressure on Jesse, though, but just said her piece. 
she did say he was going to see her mom and daddy before he left on back home because she done invited his and ma and the boys and their paws as well. Reckon that was how it was to be, so get her done. Well, after the party and everybody went home, Jesse's pa had a man-to-man -man talk with Jesse. Now, it was all good, and he about said what the boys told him on their trip. They was going to meet Monique's folks and have a nice little visit going home. He said that that gal had a good hate on her shoulders and was downright beautiful too. Kind of reminded Mr. McBrayer of Jesse's Ma Sarah. The next day there was a surprise. Awaiting for the boys at the airport, a brand new plane outfitted with the latest and greatest of aviation equipment. The new queen was juiced up a mite as well and was a beautiful lady. Buster and I just couldn't wait to fly her. They got their chance by flying to New Orleans and going to see Monique and their folks. When all of them got there, Monique's mom and daddy said it was the nicest thing ever done for, done for them, and they surely appreciated the help. Well, Jesse and the boys told them it was their pleasure to help them out of the tight. About that time, Renard come up with a little wine and told the boys that that hog was ready to eat. Which hog, they asked. The one that ate the onions and drank the wine. And Renard went out bellering and a laughing. The best dang pork they ever did eat, and the boys, Pauls, and Grandpa Gus said they was going to have to try that back home. Now all the boys and the men folk had a heck of a good time, met up with some real nice folks, and made some new friends too. Now, Renard said he was sorry for them to leave and come on back real soon. Now Monique see Jesse off with a hug him and a kiss, and she laid on him. <laughs> Like who'd have thought it before he left? Jesse was plumb swooning over that, I tell you. Now, Mr. McBrayer told Jesse he didn't rightly know where he got them pheromones, but whichever side of the family it was from, they done him proud. Well, they all laughed, including Jesse. Life was sure dealing some new cards for the boys nowadays. They all wasn't wondering what was just round the corner. Jesse said perfume and skeeter cream. Well, one even all the boys' folks had supper whilst the boys was gone. Every one of the boys was a blessing to their folks, they said, and the will of the Lord allowed for the four families to be united. Well, Grandpa Gus said him and Grandpa had lived to see electricity, cars, and fellers on the moon, but never expected to see and experience what they had with the boys and their adventures. Now, Mr. Ollinger said he wondered what all they would have missed without them very special boys. Well, Mr. Holmes said he knew the Lord had him and Shirley to make decisions to be here at this time. They could have moved on out to Colorado before they settled down here and met all the families. Mr. and Ms. McBrayer said they was surely blessed with a son like Jesse, and the boys was just like their own. All smart, healthy, and just turned to be good men. All the Ma's and Pa's agreed on that and give thanks to the Lord for the boys and their love and family. It was purely a match made in heaven. Y'all have a blessed day now, and more of Buster and the boys will be a-coming.